Today we have with us Mr. Mahmoud Qanati, the founder of Qanati of Jadar. Did I say that right? That's correct. Okay. <laughs> Which is something, was it like the House of Qanati? Yeah, it's, uh, it's in French called the uh, House of Qanati, the House of Making Art Objects. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm sure you chose that name. <laughs> <laughs> I was told that was the right word for it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, we're privileged to have you over here. Thank We've you. been tracking you for a long time, by the way. And we'll talk about how we met and, and what we were doing before. Um, but first, I want to tell you, thank you for coming on the show. And I look forward to hearing your story and the journey and uh, the uh, remarkable achievements that you've done. And it really is a remarkable achievement. For, yani, on the offset, in the beginning, I just want to congratulate you, Yanni, for what you've done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. I think, uh, yes, I mean, it, it feels like uh, yesterday, but more than 20 <laughs> years ago. Yep. Um, uh, but thank you so much for having me. Uh, uh, the story has been so exciting. I wouldn't say it was a walk in the park, but uh, alhamdulillah. Yani. Uh, Those are the best stories, by the way. Yeah, yeah. The, walk in the, park, the walk in the park are boring stories. It's never that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but we, we, we want to hear about your journey. Now, first in the beginning. So when we first met, you were working for uh, Ibrahim Khalikano, uh, the, specifically the Toyota department or the marketing department in, yeah. in Ibrahim Khalikano. And um, and we were working together because we were doing test drives on cars, and you were the person who was choosing what cars that we should talk about or write about and things like that. And, and a lot of great memories, actually, great great memories. <laughs> that's in that. so I'll true. Not, not forget. Uh, but we'll talk about cars at the end because you know that's my love, and I'm not yeah. sure if it still is your love, but it's something that you started. So I'm sure that's something that you're, sure. you know that plays a little role in your life. Um, and then from there, you moved on to the banking sector, correct? That's correct. It was was it Standard Chartered or what bank were uh, you? So the very first bank was HSBC. Okay. Yeah, okay. Then Standard Chartered. All right. Then I moved to Dubai with Standard Chartered. Oh. Then Bahrain Islamic Bank and now Salam Bank. So how long were you in Dubai for? For five years. Oh, that's that's that's. Yeah. Uh, 2012 uh, to 2017. Okay. Yeah. How, how was that experience? It was life changing. I absolutely loved. I, I'm I'm not saying it was easy. At the beginning, it was so hard. I think it humbled me. Hmm. I thought I was great in marketing. I thought I was I was knowing it all. But when you go there, the first thing is that humbles you is the the fact that you are an expat now, hmm. and that is weird, but good weird. Um, you appreciate things differently. The second thing is that you are surrounded by so many different nationalities, great brains, great capabilities, and you would resist that at the very beginning, saying, no, I, it can't be true, I am better, until you just give up and say, you know what, it's time to learn. And, um, and I had an awful experience with my manager, who is today my mentor and, and, a, and a very close friend. Wow. Um, uh, we had fights that went all the way to the HR, and it was ugly. And then I just said one thing. I said, I cannot change people around me. I'm not supposed to change people around me. I can only change myself. And that was the biggest milestone in my life. It was 2014. I made that decision. And that's it. I just became a different person. Uh, every moment, every scenario is, is, uh, is a learning point. Uh, I listen more than, than expressing. Uh, I like to share what, what I learn. Uh, yeah, so that was Dubai for me. I would love to go back. What are some of the... You, you did say it, uh, but I also like to hear maybe a little bit more. What are some of the, uh, what did you learn? What did you learn there that you're applying today in your life that you learned in Dubai, working um, for the industry and the company that you were working for and having that difficulty with um, your manager, who's now a mentor? Mm. By the way, that's, that's um, I don't want to say that's common, but I've had similar experiences when I was in my younger years and employed. Uh, I couldn't stand uh, a particular manager like, I'd go home and tell my dad, I'm quitting. That's it. Yeah. I'm quitting. And my dad says, no, no, you know, you know, you know, smooth, stay there. Yeah. And, and I'd go back and, uh, and honest to God, it's those managers that today I remember that today I try to, uh, you know, 
implement their thoughts and their ideas into what I do. It's, it's, it's those managers. The ones that were like, just let me do what I want to do, whatever, those are the ones that didn't really... Yeah. I mean, it was nice at the time, but it didn't help my growth. Absolutely. So would you, yeah. um, what are some of the things, if you can recall, some of the things yeah. that, that I would say that the listeners can also maybe understand or learn from your experiences and how you managed to... By the way, were you married at that time? Yeah, I was married at that time and I got divorced during the same time. That was also part of the of the life changing experience. So it uh, it was you know um, rock bottom, but then all the way all the way to the opposite. Mm. Um, but let me tell you uh, some of the things that I still implement, that I still uh, learn and try to pass on, is it's nothing to do with the hard skills. Like you know, hard skills is something you can you can learn. Uh, there are lots of videos you can you can you can watch. It was the soft skills, mm. how to um, uh, work with people, how to manage people, whether that person is above you, is below you, is you know, uh, is a peer. Um, mostly, how can you be a few steps ahead of the game, ahead of everything else? How can you read the situation, predict what can go wrong, be ready? Uh, he taught me the right word for all of this, orchestration. Hmm. So he said, how can you be the orchestra master of any project, of any, any situation or any incident? So, and I do this in my work life. I do this in my, in my passion project. I do this in my personal life. It's just knowing the end goal and then working backwards and then defining who do you need to make this happen, who don't you need, what are the hard deadline stops. Um, so all of these things, you know, but not on an Excel sheet in your brain. Um, I don't know. I'm just, it's awesome uh, every time I speak about it. And it's working. It has been working. So 2014-15, you're in uh, Dubai. Um, when did you leave Dubai? 2017. 2017. <clears throat> and uh, you had a, an unfortunate personal experiences, as you said, uh, family person. And uh, so what happened that made you leave? Was it, was it an opportunity that picked up over here? Or was it just you just had enough of Dubai? No. So, um, so I can, I can uh, d- you know, divide the five years in Dubai into three phases. So phase one, which was the resistance mm-hmm. and uh, the, the the downfall. Mm-hmm. And then there was a year of trying to figure myself out. And then there were two years, the last two years of, you know, build up and, um, and you know, uh, find myself. Uh, the last two years, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to you know, uh, get remarried. Uh, and I actually found, you know, I met my wife in Dubai. Oh, no way. Yeah, we're both in marketing and she completely complements right. uh, who I am. So in 2017, uh, for personal reasons, because my kids from my uh, first right. uh, marriage um, were in Bahrain, they were young. So I said, OK, although I'm so happy in Dubai, I need to go back. Right. I need to spend those critical times uh, of my life and their life with them. Uh, so I decided to go back and, uh, you know, build this new family dynamics while it is fresh. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it's, it was the best decision ever. It was the right decision. Well, well then, I'm sure that wasn't easy. It you? wasn't easy at all. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of the <laughs> obstacles that you had and the challenges that you had to overcome. Just from yeah. a personal, not even from a professional part. Um, so when you came back to Bahrain, was it still the same uh, bank that you were in? To, or was it a different bank that you joined when you mm. returned to Bahrain? Uh, I so um, I joined. Uh, the timing was perfect, and I, um, thank God it it just the opportunity came at the right time with Bahrain Islamic Bank okay. as the uh, head of marketing and corporate communication, reporting to an ex uh, CEO of Standard Chartered. So he was trying to build a new brand, okay. and um, he, he was new on the job as well. So he he needed someone who could. Uh, reposition uh, the brand and this was my first experience in a local bank so okay. I've always been in international banks and and again this was 
a fantastic um, you know change of, uh, mm. of of career. I think working for international names like Toyota, Lexus, and I mean you know uh, you were there at the time. It builds the foundation, mm. and then Standard Chartered, HSBC. It just teaches you the the the, the basis, the standards, the the rules, the discipline. And then after 20 years of that, you go and implement it in a local bank where it's like the, the leash is longer, so right. you, you could do more. You, you define the guidelines, you define the rules. And I felt like I was a superhero. Okay. And, you know, I, I think it was fantastic, you know. So it was uh, from day one, you were in marketing, even from, from the first job you had and yeah. throughout your whole banking career. Yeah. It's marketing. Is that your um, educational background? Yeah, I, you know, if none of this would have, would have been possible if it wasn't for you know uh, Brian Khil Khan of family, which I truly love. I still you know look back and say, it's, it's, I'm emotionally attached to that job still the most. Right. Um, they sponsored me from the university. I was studying marketing in year two, and then from year three and year four, I was studying and working. We built the marketing department together, and um, and yeah, so never left marketing since then. Marketing and corporate communication. Ibrahim Ibrahim Kanu himself. When we when I first did the magazine back in the Arabian Motors magazine, back in 2000, 2000 2001 and two and three, um, Ibrahim himself was the first person, the first advocate, the first person that was supporting us, the first person that came that said, you know, talk about my car. Do a review on my car. He helped us in terms of the marketing, and I will never, never forget what he did um, and how he stood with us and how it was his his input and his belief that uh, started you know what it, everything is today. Yeah. And so uh, he was ahead of uh, ahead of everybody's time. Like you know when he did the I remember Rumble in the Desert, right. Um, the um, you know the magazine, the F1, like you you see those things happening now. Like right. he, you know he was thinking about he was pushing the bar twenty years ago. Uh, so yeah, I mean he yeah. was uh, he was my direct line manager back then, and uh, again again I just look back at that time as a very nice you know um, experience. Yeah, yeah. No, he definitely knows his cars and. <laughs> and oh my god the selection he has it's just yes. mind-blowing mind-blowing selection of cars and uh, maybe one day we'll have the honor of having him on the show as well and talk about his uh, his journey i'm sure he would love to I, speak about that i love cars so. <laughs> <laughs> i can see the sparkle yes, in your eyes the sparkle is there. <laughs> so you're back in bahrain closer to your family closer to your kids you have a new partner in life uh, a new job that you're you're more of a uh, a position of decision making and decision of, uh, uh, let's just say, leading leading the company mm. to where it should be given the experiences that you've had, and 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 they're right for choosing you, and and so is the manager is right for choosing somebody that he's already he already knows you, he already understands you, he knows what what you went mm. through, and those are the type of people that you need to lead um, a, exactly. a brand. Uh, so what happened then? Because I know they changed the brand as well, right? So I was um, I, I was leading that. So um, so what happened was this was 2017. Um, at that time, when I came back, I was just so uh, you know pumped to to just like do things, and the challenge was huge. It was an Islamic bank. How can you change an Islamic bank where the the mindset internally and the mind, mindset externally? is looking at, at this entity from a very religious perspective. Mm. How can you change that without, um, you know, losing the identity and without upsetting those who love it the way it is? Um, so again, going back to orchestration, you right. know, how to um, uh, involve the, peop the people, the clients into this journey of brand uh, reformation um, and none of this can be possible if you don't have the right support from your from your line manager mm -hmm. so the CEO from day, day one said Mahmoud you, this is you know you're a brand builder you know this tell me what you need and I work at my best with these kind of you know enablers um, so did the rebranding we repositioned the brand 
from a very kind of traditional, solid Islamic bank into um, an innovation powerhouse, uh, targeting the youth, very fresh. Uh, we were inspired by pop art, right. you know, f funky colors. And, uh, you know, we had a very simple slogan, uh, uh, simplifying money matters. Right. Um, and, yeah, so that was the beginning uh, of my, my new life. That was from the bank perspective. Um, 2017 was also, uh, actually early 2018 is with, um, you know, I was blessed with my, my third uh, child, uh, Yara. And, you know, it was a moment like, okay, I'm so blessed that I went through this tough time, but now I am, I'm happy. I feel I am at my best, you know, capability and potential. And I was always wanted to be an entrepreneur and, and do something because mm -hmm. I felt I'm not doing enough. Uh, I, I, was, I was thinking, I mean, if, if you know, life is just is fast, right. I want to remember leaving an impact and I want my family to say Mahmoud left an impact. Just being good at work wasn't enough. It was never enough. And I went to the very, and I remember this was April 2018. Uh, my daughter was days mm. old. And I said, you know what? I, uh, uh, I want this to be the, the start of something new. And I want to leave a legacy. Immediately I knew that the name of this business is going to be my family name. Because I want to leave that. And I should go to the basics. What do I love? What am I passionate about? Maybe you don't know this about me, uh, Samir, but I've always been in love with timepieces, with watches. I didn't know that. Yeah. I don't know. We never had that. Uh, that never popped up in the yeah. times that we spent together. Because when you're around cars, there's nothing else right, you see, right? right? right. <laughs> Although cars and watches, you know, they go hand in hand. Because I love watches too. I'm... I'm, I'm I love watches. I'm actually loyal to a particular brand, but I'm okay. You know, yeah. I, I, will, I, will, I will start entertaining other things. No, but, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still uh, loyal to many brands um, because uh, I just feel that I've added something new to, to that universe. And I'm going to explain how. But um, I remember my first watch was I was definitely... I think eight or nine years old my mom was uh, at Hajj and I she said what do you want me to get you and I said I want the Casio that is a remote control right the one with full of buttons and all and I oh my god that was like the best thing ever I don't think I use it a lot but and I it's so sad because we moved house and I don't know where it is but I managed to um, retrieve my grandfather's uh, watch. Okay. It's a West End, ah. and that is the only watch uh, I wear. Um, really? Yeah, now. So either my own watches or my grandfather's uh, watch. But, but then, then, so it wasn't necessarily a brand. I wasn't like in love with brands. I was in love with hmm. the way they look, something different. I, I felt they were whatever that was pleasing to my eyes uh, and an extension of my personality because I maybe wasn't the normal or, or grew up to to be not a typical normal um, you know standard looking uh, person I was wearing you know uh, funky socks and you know designing my own shirts um, so this was in line with that right so used to buy all sorts of watches from you know Alibaba, from APs to you know to Rolexes, but it was it was all about the looks. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. So it wasn't so much of the timepiece or the or the or the Swiss made. Uh, yeah. It was more of how how that looked and yeah. how it made you feel. How it yeah. It was never about the time telling. Right. Because no watch was telling the right time. <laughs> it was never. I mean, I buy it. Uh, it would, if it was quartz, it would the battery would die. I would never, you right. know, change that. If it's an automatic, I would never uh, make sure that it's it's. Uh, you know, when the aircraft lands right. and you, everyone is like changing the time. Right. I've never ever done that in my life. Yeah. So it was just about how it felt. Really, I, I mean, <clears throat> I had an, an incident actually this summer. 
Uh, every time I, I go to I go to the states every summer, and I I love my my the watch that I that I tell you that I that I like. Well, I have a lot of those type of watches, uh, Breitling, mm. and uh, every time I go, I usually take two watches with me, and uh, you know one is for daily use and one is for maybe evening use or something like that because they look a little bit different. They're the same but brands but look different. This time I said this is silly. I'm just going to take one. And I'll wear it wherever I go, whatever I go. It's a great watch. It's an amazing watch, and it's it does its purpose. Mm. Within the next day, I arrive in, in the states in California. The next day I arrived, it stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> it just completely stopped working, and I wasn't going to go try and fix it over there. I want to come back here and go to the dealer and fix yeah. it over here because this is where I, I know them and this is how they take care of me as well. Yeah. So for one month, I was wearing it, and it wasn't working. It was just not working. And every every day, I like change it a little bit just to make it look a little different. But for a whole month, I but my watch did not work for a whole thirty days while I was there. But I, that's that watch I had, and I loved it, so I was wearing it. So I, I kind of understand, and I had that experience. Yeah. What you're just talking about this summer. But I wasn't feeling awkward about it. <laughs> I was. I was like, oh look, it's time to. <laughs> <laughs> but you are, you are. You, I agree with you. I, I understand what you're saying, and, and I, I'm, I really, you, you make a lot of sense in the sense that uh, I mean, a timepiece. It's a beautiful timepiece. It really is. They do tell you the time, but it's also how it makes you feel having it on your wrist. Uh, yeah. How it's, uh, it's a piece of art. It's a piece of it's art. A piece of art. Yeah. So now to to how did this thing happen, right? So I I figured. I love watches. I don't honestly care about the time telling. I just came out of a very, you know, emotionally tiring experience, but I feel really good. So it's all about those moments that define who you are. Uh, so I said, okay, it's going to be something to do with watches. And it's going to be something about um, your rest. Because we uh, men, uh, the rest is a is an ideal real estate mm. for an accessory or or something. And then I started to read more about you know how wh- how people why people buy watches and you know the 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 growth uh, or the um, the latest trend in men uh, timepieces, jewelry, accessories, consumer behavior. And I've realized a few things. One is that men are becoming more expressive. And how do they express themselves? It's through watches and other things, like jewelry. The other thing is that we don't have enough options. So the biggest go-to is the watch. Then you have bracelets, you have rings, you have necklaces, and then others like, you know, a suit, brooch, and that's it. Which means Which led to the third fact is that the sale of unisex products globally is skyrocketing. It's not because women are buying more, it's because men don't have enough options and they're buying those things. So so now I found my passion, I found what will it be more or less, and then there was the data to prove that there is a there is a space for um, a male product. Uh, now to the last and the most important point is that men are very sentimental if you think about it if you ask now you just talked about your Breitling watch right and and you have the full story about it you love it when did you buy it you know why did you buy it was my dad see <laughs> that this is absolutely the case with almost every man I mean that's why I like Breitling because my dad is a bright, my See, my, my oh, dad had it, and uh, when I and I had the Casios, I had the calculator. Yeah, I had, I had, I had the Seikos. I had all of them. I had the uh, Rado, which I loved. Yeah, Rado. I, yeah, I had you know all, all the um, Oris and all the brands and the Rolexes, but my dad liked Brightly. See, and that had a you know sentimental value to me. You're right, and when 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 I when he gave me one of his, it was his which meant a lot to me. And it was a nice watch, which also meant a lot to me. And that just started that trajectory. Exactly. But it's a, you're it would right. mean the world to us mm. so when something like this happened. Now, there's no money that can buy that. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was the most important aspect of this uh, idea, is that men are very sentimental with the things that would help them express themselves. 
So I've put all of this together and I said, okay, you know what? Uh, we celebrate moments. So I don't want to do a time-telling thing because there are so many watches and I think the Swiss manufacturers are competing on who can make the most complicated machine <laughs> that at the end of the day is going to tell you it's 3 p.m., yeah. right? I said, I want to do the opposite. I want to stop time. I want to freeze time. And freeze it on a moment that is sentimental to you. So that moment can be in the past, or that moment can be in the present, or that moment can be in the future. Like, for example, Elon Musk, I'm sure he's daydreaming about the day he's going to land on, the, on Mars, right? I'm sure he is. So that is a moment in the future. Hmm. Or I could, you know, freeze a moment when I was, um, you know, holding my mom's hand in the streets of Hamburg, a very special moment. That's in the past. So you choose a moment. And then you could wear that moment on your wrist. Um, so that was the idea. Now, to bring that idea to life, what are the things that can bring life moments? It's usually a smell or an object. Right. When you smell a perfume, immediately you just you time travel. Or you hear. Something. Or you hear. You time travel. So those things I can't capture, right. but I can capture objects. So then I said, okay, this will be the client would provide me with something that is personal to him or to her. It can be um, a gemstone that belongs to the, to, to the mother, a, a heirloom or a, or a you know, um, relic. Um, and then we would embed this into this piece. And then the, uh, it's fully personalized to that person. Wow. So every purse, every piece is one of one, because now this now takes me to the fifth and last point is that the future of marketing is not brands being brands, it's people being becoming right. brands, or actually they have become. And I mean, Samir, you are a brand to me. <laughs> I mean, from day one, I grew up knowing that Samir, like you, Samir, motorsport, that's your brand. So the future is people are the brand. So I decided I'm going to make a brand or a, or a business that considers the person or the client as the brand, and I will fully customize everything to them. It is their moments. It is based on something that they choose, they provide to me, and then it is constructed or handcrafted for them. Now the idea was almost complete. Now I want, needed someone who can take that idea out of my head and then translate it. I um, was fortunate enough to meet um, 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 one of the best jewelry bloggers in the world, Katerina Perez, which she's the reason why this brand exists today. How do you meet her? Out of the, I was just sending messages left and right, DMs on, on Instagram to people to just like, I needed advice. I have this idea and I don't know what to do with it. Okay. She was the only one who responded. And um, she. So, what did you say? I have an, adv I I have have an idea. I have an idea. I'm, I'm in Bahrain and I need to run an idea by you to see if it's. I want to know what you, th what you feel about it. And Katerina happens to have Bahrain as, you know, she has very close connection with Bahrain because she comes to Jewelry Arabia all the time and she knows about the history of Bahrain pearls and all of that stuff. So it's like, oh, my, oh my God, someone from Bahrain. Hmm. So I, I, she got curious. We had a chat and she said, Mahmoud, I, I am in jewelry and I've seen watches. I have not seen this idea in my life. She's right. Yeah. Because I haven't either. And, and I was like, oh my God, this is... I want to do more. Then she said, I know exactly the person who would take this idea and bring it to life. Uh, he's a French designer. His name is Frédéric Manet. Uh, he's designed for Dior, Chanel, Piaget, but he's an independent designer. He's crazy as you. I said, awesome. So met him and he fell in love with the idea. And he introduced me to a third person who is uh, the person who takes that sketch and then makes it by hand. Wow. That's his name is Jyoti Saroj Ebrusa. He's also French. He's a sculptor. 
more than being a jeweler and he specialized in miniatures mm. so yeah. that's it that's the team became complete in 2019 early 2019 i they at that time i had some very silly prototypes which i have kept them one day i hope i have i'll have a museum oh, yeah so like very very silly but uh idea was there frederick took all of that and created a design identity he used sacred geometry and the golden ratio and uh, polygonal and 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 started to sketch and he told me something interesting he said Mahmoud, your idea is based on something that used to exist i think maybe a thousand years ago or or, or perhaps less which during um, christianity like you know uh, sometime down the line um, people used to um, keep objects that belong uh, belong to um, uh, saints um, or like this is a piece of a fabric from uh, uh, right. from the Christ right. or something like right. that and then they used to keep them in this cabinet very beautiful cabinet that's called relics right um, so you're trying to do this but in a, in a very modern way I never knew that mm. this was there so and I remember this so this was and I know you believe in science, yeah. so I was like, oh my God, so this is really something important that, you know, people loved it and people still love it. I was in, in Paris meeting with Frederick and Jyoti. Uh, I love uh, museums, so I went to um, the, um, uh, the Louvre Museum, and I love the Mesopotamian civilization. I feel it's undervalued, mm. um, and no one talks about it where they should. So I spent time there. I was going past that museum. And, you know, we're all curious and in and, and love with the story of Gilgamesh, right. uh, who came to Dilmun. Mm. So I went to uh, this huge statue of Gilgamesh. And I'm like, oh, my God, why is he wearing a watch? Wow. Yeah. And so there's, there's something on his wrist. He's wearing a watch. And I look around and I go to the next statue, to the next wall relief, and all of the kings of Mesopotamia are wearing two identical watches on the rest. And I'm saying, okay, I'm super curious. This can't be just a <laughs> random thing. So, and they really looked very similar to what I was doing, uh, which is something very similar to this. Right. Um, went immediately to the hotel and started to read about it. It was called the Bracelet of the Divine. It was only, um, uh, it was something that only the kings or those who were, or, or were on, in power used to wear them. Uh, further search showed me that there were uh, bracelets made of gold and um, full of pearls and gemstones and they were identical, so they were wearing both. Some conspiracy theories say that they were like time traveling watches, or right. that, that's that's not. But not they told the time. I mean, they, they were they were, no. were they telling time or mostly no. uh, bracelets that just just bracelets that had a special stone or a special yeah. kind of um, uh, some kind of a value to them, some True. significant value. Yeah. To them. So that was like you know when when you're in military and you have those ranking. Right. So this was something to do with oh, the ranking okay. in the society. Okay. okay. And yeah, it was just um, a very beautiful piece of jewelry that men used to wear, not the women, mm. men. And there was, I saw many of these in person, one of which is in the uh, Doha uh, Museum of Islamic Art. Um, it just looks awesome. It just like, you know, it uh, uh, looks very similar to this, but in a very traditional looking one. I'll show you a picture later. Right. So... Then I said, okay, you know what? This is the missing, the missing link is complete. I am from Bahrain. I want to do something that is so French. <laughs> I saw this in France. Gilgamesh came to Dilmun. He found the flower of life, right? Twice, and I know about the flower of life. It, was, it might be a mythical idea. But then scientists say that the flower of life was the pearl right. in Bahrain. So I found the connection, like, you know, I'm trying to bring back the importance of the pearl or Bahrain's position in this, in this place. And I'm trying to introduce it 
in, in a form of a bracelet that is only made for people of power or the chosen ones, which I'm trying to do, mm. that's it. The story is complete. I, uh, I am not inventing something new. I'm bringing back an old uh, heritage based on the Mesopotamian civilization. Based on Bahrain as well? Based on Bahrain's story of Gilgamesh. Mm. So the flower of life is coming back after 4,000 years from Bahrain in the shape of a, uh, of a bracelet. And it tells your story. It's made for you. It's handmade. It's one of one. That's it. It's one of one. So everything you're making is on an order basis. You you and it's customized to the person's. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's unless I ask for two, you don't yeah. make two or of the same. So it really yeah. it's completely unique and completely original. Yeah. And it's all one of one. But to show the world what what the brand is capable of, we we launched a collection in Paris and uh, during the fashion week in uh, last year yep. in July and we called it the celebration of time and here we wanted to challenge the the luxury industry now you see the luxury industry is is one of the oldest industries and perhaps the least flexible mm. that's why they did not react very well to to COVID if they want to come up with a new design about nature to, uh, it would either be, I don't know, um, a panther, a butterfly, or let's say uh, a bird. Mm. They wouldn't go beyond that. So it's very restricted. Mm. We said, how about we completely challenge that? We go into territories that they don't go. So the collection is, is, is called the Celebration of Time. We chose seven moments, because the brand is all about moments. Those moments are from the very beginning of time to the future. Why we chose seven is, again, following sacred geometry and because the flower of life has, uh, the, the, the uh, seed of life has seven circles. And then we created 13 pieces because the flower of life has 13 circles. Oh, wow. Yeah, so all of these things were connected. Um, the seven moments were from the very beginning, the Big Bang explosion, then the Jurassic era, uh, then the Roman Empire, uh, the, um, the, uh, the Middle East and the Islamic and the pearling industry, then um, uh, um, uh, Formula One, uh, and then space. Um, so you designed a wa uh, like a timepiece or a bracelet for a each bracelet one of those. Bracelet and a watch. Okay. For each, because yeah. down the line I realized that so I was doing some market uh, study. Uh, pe although people love the idea of the bracelet, but it was very new. Mm. So why does it look like a watch but it doesn't tell time? Mm -hmm. So I needed another product that could easily be understandable, it's a hybrid model. Mm. So I brought a watch that tells the story so there's a sculpture that is custom customized but then it, it, it tells time mm. so then like the Mesopotamian kings you could wear one on uh, one rest and the other one on the right, other rest right. and so that was the the story of the uh, of the 13 pieces and and the, the uh, collection an amazing amazing story so uh, not all your um, braces have watches in them right yeah uh, some of them have watches. Some of them are just bracelets with with, a, with an art. But all of them yeah. are, are have an art piece inside. Yeah. So they're all one-of-a-kind art pieces or what I call wearable art. Um, the one that have has the glass dome, so that's the bracelet, uh, where it looks like a watch but it doesn't tell time. It's like your personal museum. Hmm. Under the glass dome, your art comes there. The watch comes with a flat surface. Uh, it has a time piece and on top, you have the sculpture, but everything is customizable for you. It starts with a sketch, so the client meets with uh, Frederick Manet, our artistic director, and he does what we call art therapy. So um, he asks you question. It's a very private and you know uh, uh, intimate experience because you're trying to make something. If I ask you, you. I mean, if you like to have a tattoo and you have, you have one tattoo to choose, it's not an easy thing to no, say. No. So he helps you um, find that element and then, okay, what item do you have? And then he starts sketching, sketching, sketching. And then together you, you choose the gemstones, you choose the materials. 
they don't have to be expensive. It's like w sometimes we use aviation uh, type aluminum, carbon fiber. Maybe a piece is, is so luxurious but has nothing precious in it, mm -hmm. in precious in this in the uh, in the sense that you know in the jewelry. Sometimes the clients themselves give you something that they well, want. Most of the time, most of the time, and some we've had experiences where the client provide us with a material and we hide it in the piece mm. where only the designer and the jeweler and the client know uh, and it's something that they would be giving it to their to their children and it's like a time capsule or something like that it's it's uh, i mean i gotta tell you now we've had s several companies in bahrain that have started uh, a watch kind of brand um i've met uh, uh some of the boys that i know um brothers actually the mm. company is called the western brothers yeah i love the name i love these guys the, the, the name the name is very cool uh, t uh, you know twb uh, TW, and i was like what's it sound for the western brothers why western brothers and, they, you know, and i'm like what this is <laughs> you so know cool. well done well done very cool um now when it came to the actual watches themselves um i, I mean they were nice but they didn't stand out to me uh they didn't like uh they, did, they didn't stand out. I mean, as you said, there's millions and millions of watches and brands that are coming up every day, and there are some really old ones. We're just talking about normal watches, not like the, the Rolexes and the Cartiers. Mm. Um, so it's really difficult to stand out in the market, and which is what, one thing I was trying to tell them is that um, what is it about you that makes you different? Uh, are you making the watches here in Bahrain? And they're like, no, they're sourcing a lot of it from Japan. Um, um, the, the design is over here, but is the design anything reflective on, on this region? Because at the end of the day, it's really challenging to create a brand, any brand. I'm not talking about jewelry, just a brand in general. And when you create a brand, in order for that brand to be somewhat stand out, you have to kind of relate it to who you are or where you are. It has something to do with you. <laughs> and are you, your story, person. Yeah. It has to be a story because you're creating a, a, a brand new brand. And this is the part I was trying to let, let these gentlemen know, and I hope I they they took some of this information. But there are so many ways that they can recognize that those those watches, be it material, be it style, be it um, calligraphy, be it numbers, be it pictures, be it things that are from this region and specifically you know from Bahrain. And I think we have Noon also. Is Noon Bahrain or Qatar? Uh, it's Bahrain. It's Bahrain. So we have Noon also, um, and they're also creating their own brand as well. And they're also trying to, you know, stand and, and, you know, create their own name. But with most of these, I was like, why would I choose them over what I love, the, the brands that I love and the other brands that are coming up that are most likely from Switzerland that have a very strong brand connection um, and that spend gazillions on marketing. Um, what is it about this watch that would make me choose it? And, and most of the times, other than the fact that it's made by Bahrainis or it's supported by Bahrainis, that was the only thing that was attractive to me. Like, I want to I get this because it was made by my you know, fellow brothers. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I want something from them. I want to support them. But let's say that watch was being sold, say, in Dubai. I wouldn't buy it. Or if it was sold in, in, in Japan, I wouldn't buy it. So I'm looking for something that would really make me buy it no matter where it is. And it has a connection to where it's from. I really think you nailed it. Mm. Honest to God, I think what you've done, I don't think, you know, forget people in Bahrain, forget people in Khalid, forget Arab. I don't think it's been done anywhere. Maybe, as you said, a thousand, two thousand years ago they were yeah. doing it. But I can no, tell you that I haven't seen done. anything in the world. And I'm not like an avid watch collector that mm. I go with. But I did a little bit of research before I came to be this. <laughs> so I, I can converse with you, you know, on, a, on, a, on your mm. level. I haven't seen anything anywhere in the world that do what you're mm -hmm. doing. The concept of customizing a bracelet slash watch is extremely unique. Uh, the concept of how it's customized. I mean, it's not just a, a, a new face or a new drawing. No, no, there's a hidden meaning. Hidden yeah. meaning. And, and how you relate it. And now from what I understood, how you relate it to Bahrain and yeah. what makes it more significant to you and to your country. I hope every box that you sell has some kind of a story or some kind of a about us or some kind of an explanation as in what you're telling me right now because it really elevates the value of, of yeah. what, what you're doing. Uh, I mean, it elevates it already because it's unique and, and, and the things that's inside it makes it even more, more precious. But then the idea and the history and the region, like, you know, somebody, I don't think people in Canada can do it. 
because they don't have the yeah. Gilgamesh connection. They don't yeah. have that. You understand? Or yeah. oh, I don't know why I said Canada, but uh, pretty much anywhere, <laughs> anywhere. You know, no, that, that, they'd have to make true. their own something that's, that's relative to them. That's and true. I think you've done something that's relative to Bahrain, and I'm. I want to say proud, but I'm 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 just so <laughs> like like. You know, really. No, no, thank it's, it's you just... so much. Thank you. I, see, the there is one more facet to this is that look at us Bahrainis. Look at Bahrain. It's a melting pot of things, of cultures, of um, you know different beliefs, different uh, thoughts. So I wanted to have Bahrain in my brand, but not in the very in the traditional way. Um, I have Bahrain in the soul of my brand because the, uh, the idea is so universal. So um, you can have anything you can think under the glass dome. So like Bahrain, it can be a home for anybody because we accept everybody. It doesn't have to have a flag on it. So I took the core like the you know uh, the story of uh, uh, of Gilgamesh, the flower of life, the fact that the fr flower of life was found engraved on caves in uh, in Greece, in uh, China, in Egypt. So what we have is universal. Uh, so uh, you know, and and when I was, I'll tell you this example that when I was in France. So on, in July, on the 4th of July, when I launched the brand, it was, I s designed it, I, I launched the brand with a strategy of going directly global rather than going local and then global. So I, when I, it's a French Bahraini brand. French is because 90% of the things are made in France, but the the Bahraini element is me and the story so and people hear the story when they meet with me and I I can't say all of this on Instagram mm. so when we were in uh, in Paris and we launched uh, there was a, a lady from the New York Times and so she was just listening and she was like if it was only about a new French brand I would never have spoken about it or I would never even write about it because it's something to do with Bahrain I'm going to write about it and then she wrote about it in, in the New York Times uh, Forbes the same thing because of the Bahraini connection because of the storytelling mm -hmm. uh, the last thing is what gra uh, you know grabbed the attention is the fact that no other brand can upscale a piece of hair, a piece of fabric, okay. uh, you know, something like that. And all the big brands, what they do is, let's say you want to create um, a new collection of jewelry. They find a beautiful gemstone. And then they take the gemstone, let's say it happens to be this big, 20 carats, whatever. Then the designer designs based on that gemstone. Correct. We do the complete opposite. First, I'll start with you. What do you want? And then I will have to find that thing for you. If you want a piece of um, the moon rock, you want a piece of uh, a dinosaur bone, you want an ancient coin, I have to find that with a certificate and give it to you. So sometimes it takes a year, sometimes it takes a month. So this is actually my question. How long does it take to create these, these remarkable customized watch bracelets? So if it's something as, I would not say, easy but i would say if, if i don't need to source materials so i have the materials something yeah. that i you know oh this is a sentimental value to me and, and i yeah. want to i want to gift it as a gift to somebody so i would say a minimum of uh, two to three months okay. a maximum of a year okay yeah but if you have the the material i would say between two to three months now what are we talking in terms of prices how, how does it i mean uh, of course, you're sourcing the material versus me giving you the material. I mean, uh, it's not, you know, I don't think you have a price chart thing. No. This is, you know, <laughs> you know um, but yeah. how how does one value, not value things, but how, how can one budget? Or how do you price it? How do you yeah? price it? So we price it based on two things, complexity and time, uh, complexity, uh, which means time it takes and the materials used. 
So I will, let me tell you the lowest option so that then, because everything else can be above that. You can choose one of these bracelets uh, and the most affordable is uh, silver. So you can have it. Uh, pure silver, pure, pure silver diamond. Pure silver, um, a, a rubber strap, um, uh, diamond dust hmm. around. You provide the gemstone. Something like this could be 1,700 dinars to 1,800 dinars. And then it just goes up from there. Um, so for 1,700 dinars today, nowhere in the world you will be able to find a timepiece or something that is handmade for you. Um, customized. Customized for you. Yeah. And then it just goes up from there. And we use like, you know, gold, titanium, platinum, carbon fiber, um, aviation, aluminum, you name it. Anything can be can be used to make your piece. Now, I noticed with, with the one that you're particularly wearing right now, it has a, a glass dome. How, like, res break it resistant is that? I mean, how, how easy is it to break it or crack it or... You love cars, right? I do. You can drive one on. There's no way. Yes. Can I just tap on it? Of course. Oh, my God. It's very, very solid. No, it's it's uh, sapphire. Oh, wow. So, uh, uh, the diamond's cousin. Uh, it's very solid. But, so this was the, or this is. Can I see how heavy it is? I just want to see how heavy yeah, it is. Of course. This is as heavy. This is not a. This is a. But I have one that is very light. Like oh, no, no, but I like heavy watches, as yeah. you can tell from the ones I'm. Ask me about the gemstone. This thing. is, what is it? Is it a sapphire? It's uh, an emerald. Emerald. It's a, That's it's my green. mom's, mom's emerald. Oh, it's your mom's emerald. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it used to be on her ring. It's beautiful. Yeah. So that's, that's you know, when I was talking about the, the moment I was holding her hand, seven years old, that's the one. And you know what? It's, it's actually very difficult for a man to wear an emerald, uh, you yeah. know, so you actually found a way of... Yes. Uh, you can wear anything uh, You can pretty much anything that is not traditionally to wear. You can actually yeah. wear it. And, and this is... Uh, yeah. This is really, really beautiful. Yeah. And I love the weight of it. I love it. Just. Yeah. I mean, with silver, it's a bit high maintenance because you need to polish it all right. the time. At well, home. I mean, yeah. But, all uh, watches, you know. The, the, yeah. I take mine every year or so to get it, you know, cleaned yeah. up. So do you have a workshop here in Bahrain that people can go to? Or like, how do people order? Is it just an online thing or is it a phone number or is it a website or? So the so our design studio is in Paris and our atelier or workshop is in Nice in south of France. Um, everything happens there, but uh, using what we learned from COVID is that you can get in touch with anybody at any time, either on a personal face-to-face uh, -face, uh, meeting or on a virtual uh, meeting. So we meet the client, but what, where we meet clients is mostly in events. Mm -hmm. So we go from one country to another um, doing exclusive preview events. We work with local partners, uh, let's say the Capital Club in Dubai. They have their own uh, you know, uh, niche clientele. I um, reserve one night and I make an experience there. So clients can come, they can have their sketches done, the designer is there, uh, they get to know, they see the products. And then we take, um, if someone is interested, then we take their contact and then th that relationship starts. Today, I have a fantastic relationship with all my clients. Most of them of which have come to my house, I've been to their houses. So it just becomes a relationship because you know something very sentimental mm -hmm. about them and as much as it's so nice that you are getting a business it's so much of a responsibility mm -hmm. that you have to i've done some religious collections on for example hinduism you can't take this lightly no so you study so when you go and talk you know what you're talking about so that's responsibility right right now with that comes you know relationship right Right. Now you talked about business, which is the part that I want to actually cover. Uh, you're not a, you haven't, is this the first time you've opened up a business? You, have you ever, first time. First time. Now, walk us through the opening business steps. Is it something you open up in Bahrain? Did you have to have a CR in Bahrain to do this? Or yeah. how, how, can you walk us through those steps and the challenges that you've had? Yeah. 
So everything has been a challenge, mm-hmm. okay? And I, I really want to focus on how things go wrong rather than how things went well. Right. Because doors open. You need to uh, look at these doors and then explore them, okay? And, and no one is unlucky. You're just not looking at those opportunities. But I want to focus on, you know, how things go wrong. Till to, I mean, until now, every day is a challenge because I haven't done this before. I come from a family that were entrepreneurship or no, nobody's a business owner. Okay. We all like to be employees and like great employees. Uh, my grandfather was an entrepreneur. He was one of the first who made halwa in Bahrain. Okay. So, uh, but the second or third or fourth generation does not have that in their mindset. So I opened, I remember I opened a CR like two years down. So I, I've been doing this now for around what, seven, mm. seven years. Um, open a CR uh, year two. What was a CR? I mean, <laughs> what was it? A watch CR, jewelry CR, or yeah, that was at the very beginning. I was like a jewelry CR, but then figured I'm not having jewelry. I'm not doing jewelry. Finally, today I decided the best fit for me is uh, uh, crafts. Okay. Art and crafts. Okay. Because that's what I do. Uh, so um, it's a CR based in Bahrain. Uh, with um, exclusive partnerships with the design studio and the uh, atelier mm. in uh, in Nice, but the headquarter of Kanati Objidar is is Bahrain. Okay. Yeah. Where where is it based? Which do you have a, a location, a particular location? No, no, it's a virtual CR okay. because technically everything is happening in France. So I just needed an entity. But very soon, I will, I will go. I, right now, if you ask me, where is your showroom? It's in the south of France. It's right. in Nice. So you right. go there, you will see the products, you will see the showcase. Um, but let's not forget, Bahrain is one of the best places to do business. Mm. We have ve- we're very f- uh, flexible. Uh, we are very open-minded. We're very forward-looking. So it was more. And it's more affordable for in, in terms of tax, etc. It was just more uh, logical for me to have the CR here, and not in France, because um, um, and I am here, so it has right. to be here. Right. So I, right. I've, I've based it here, but because Bahrain has this flexibility of a virtual CR, is that I was able to do it here while my premises is in France. Okay. Okay. But eventually, you are thinking of having some kind of a of a of a presence, uh, a physical presence in in Bahrain, um, yes, somewhere that fits your. Uh... But it will not be. Uh, I don't want to expose all the cards, but <laughs> it will not be in the very typical form of right. a, a luxury brand. Right. It might be like a capital club right. lounge. It right. can be so something like that, right. where it's an experience rather than you just go and look. Because most of the time, I don't have any pieces to, to show. It's true, because you make one off. I <laughs> make one off. So you need to be, you need to go. Th- and, and So I'm, I'm trying to find what is common, experiential way, globally. Then I have to be there. That's very, very interesting. Now, what, what yeah. happens when, when you design something and let's say I didn't like it? Or let's say it's, it, it's something I didn't, I didn't like, it's not what I expected. Where do you go from there? Uh, do, you, do you work to fix it to the way that I do like it? Yeah. Do you tell the client that, look, this is actually the best way that we can incorporate your idea and your relics into this thing? And how does that work? Yeah. When, because it's, I'm not seeing what I'm buying. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm committing, I'm commissioning you. So I'm paying in advance. There's some kind of a payment that I have to do, some like 50% payment or yeah. something. So I pay you in advance for an idea that's sketched, most likely. You sketch it for me. Uh, you have some kind yeah. of an idea of what's going to, you know the materials that are going to be used because I either give it to you or you're going to be agreeing with me. But at the end of the day, four or five months later, you bring me the product. Mm-hmm. And let's say that it's not the way I like it. I can, the, the rubber band is not really how I like exactly. it. Or the shining, you know, things. Or the, um, What happens? What happens is that you are part of the process every single day. Huh. So, from, so until the sketch ends, you have no commitment. So you might just say, I love the the sketch, but I just don't want to hmm. make it. I would go personally and print that uh, sketch on a canvas, frame it and give it to you. 
because it would be an honor for me for you to have oh, wow. that that sketch okay. at uh, you know in your office or in your house but if you decide to go for it and uh, there is a minimum deposit that you you know you uh, you can pay then we give you a timeline the timeline is you see your design becoming first a 3d model so you could imagine it and then so you have uh, sometimes weekly sometimes bi-weekly sometimes monthly meetings let's say the project takes six months the first phase now this this once the sketch is ready right and you've chosen the the materials the first meeting is uh, you see the stuff as as 3d do you make do you like to make it bigger do you like to make it smaller you might change it and it becomes very different than the sketch mm. but you can do it because you're part of the process and many almost everybody changes things through the the process so make it bigger make it smaller change it no um now that i see i see see it 3d i think i want to change the material no problem as long as there's no huge like, right, difference right. right so you change you you see and then uh, in the process let's say you wanted an ancient coin from saudi arabia which is this is a, this was a true case someone wanted um from a 90, early 1900s uh, when Al, uh, uh, Hussein bin Ali was the ruler of Hijaz. So we found multiple coins. So I send you pictures of them. Which one would you like? This is the size of this. This is made of silver. This is made of copper. Then you choose. And then we source it. And then we move to the next uh, phase, which is... Um, so once the 3D is final, uh, now we need to produce. So he starts to to handcraft the piece. We show it to you in a video. And you see it, and then you say, "Okay, nice." Then we go forward. Then we go forward. Then we s send you samples of the the strap to your house. Three or four samples. You choose, and then you're involved every step of the way. And there is a video. Video is the, the everything is documented in a video that you get it at the end of the the project it's, actually it's it's pretty good pretty clever <laughs> because you're 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 making a story out of a story yeah i mean there's the watch has a story or the bracelet has a story yeah. and you're documenting the story of how that story is being made yeah so i'm getting the you know my final product which is what i wanted and i'm getting the journey that had to do you know to achieve how, that, how, how, how it happened. was made um and then when it's done you get the piece <laughs> you get the piece you get an nft for the piece because it's one of one okay you get you get an nft for the sketch by the way you get the original sketch hmm. you know the first one he the the, the designer made uh, signed you get certificate of authenticity for every gemstone used um and um you there's a nice egg which is inspired by the egg of life yes. that comes from the flower of life yes. because you're giving birth right. to a piece in a nice piano black box so everything is what was what was what was the most expensive one you made the um, the roman empire one the Colosseum. who did you make it for was it something a showpiece or did you make yeah it was part of the celebration, celebration. of time collection it has a 2000 year old ancient coin we got it from an auction the details on the Colosseum. If I can show you a zoomed image, you would think this is a real building, with the like old damage on the building and things like that. Uh, there is a Roman uh, seal inside. The stones. I mean, it's just a. It's one of those pieces that I don't want to sell. Like okay. I, I don't want to. I want it's, it to stay. It's a, it has a lot of significant value to you. It's one of the ones you made originally. Yeah, and uh, and uh, as you said, it's a, lot, a very very creative. Uh, you made it extremely creative. I mean, you yeah. came up with some things that are. I I can honestly tell you that there's not one watch in the world that exists today, in modern time, that has a Roman Colosseum <laughs> inside it that you can see <laughs> three dimensional. This is yeah. just um, so. Um, have what are the weirdest things that you've been commissioned to to uh, to do for for a client? Um, how many have you made? So far, so uh, I've made thirteen during the first collection. I made around, I was, I, I'm 
15 bespoke. Okay, yeah. 15 bespoke. In, uh, in one year, yeah. And uh, so we're in 2023, at the end of 2023. And um, how many, so there's about 30, 40, of, 20 of your watches that are out in the market today that, that people are owning? Yeah, approximately. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what was the most, did you have a difficult challenge with, with somebody or a person? Are they all men, by the way? No. Uh, they are uh, 70% men. 70% men. Around 70% men. Um, so we we attract men easily because that's the core value of the brand. But um, women love it. Uh, and so one of the things that I want to you know, evolve the brand into is um, uh, people love the bracelet, but it's too big for, for, for ladies. So the next collection is going to be something that looks like this. The glass is flatter and smaller. So uh, it will be called Lady Kanati. So it will, will be m made for for ladies. And this is a fantastic mm. idea. I think you'll, you'll be doing a lot of, in that market as well. Uh, yeah, because we have been um, just not, we weren't ready for, for, for you know, smaller rests. Uh, they are big. I mean, they, um, they are made to be seen. Right. They're not meant to be hidden. Uh, but one of the, um, I've always looked at the brand as an art mm. brand. And, and this was something that it evolved. Like I, I, I was like, oh, I'm a watch brand or I'm a jewelry brand. I was being rejected in exhibitions that don't accept watches. And finally I said, I'm an art brand. Right. And to be an art brand, you need to appeal to art collectors. So two things, actually three things happened that today are making me really proud that we've kind of established that positioning. One, uh, one of the biggest art galleries in, uh, in Florida, in uh, Palm Beach, Worth Avenue. Uh, the very beginning of Worth Avenue, there is an art gallery that bought two of our watches the piece is in the same aisle next to Picasso and oh, Takashi wow. Murakami. That was like, well I, I, yeah, I, I just like I was tearing up <laughs> when, when that happened. The second and the third are art collectors buying them. And I have a problem. They're not wearing them hmm. because these, I don't know. I mean, some of them think that it might, you know, increase in value, but they're not wearing them. So it will increase in value by default, just because they're so unique and there's not these are one-offs, um, which I'm sure you know. So I'm not telling you something you don't know. Mm. Um, going back to the to the ladies' uh, market, again with the limited knowledge that I have in this area, the many the t the amount of times I've bought a customized jewelry for my wife is a hundred to one to the amount of times she bought some customized <laughs> jewelry for me. So men are a lot more, um, you know, they want to. They want to gift a gift to their to their significant other, to their partners, to their wives, and they want it to be so unique, uh, so that nobody else has what she has. You know that that everybody wants that, mm. even, even men want that. Um, but it gets challenging because you know you go to the jewelry store, you make this and make it different, make that, and you know and and you know the ladies like to wear it and and, and like to show something that nobody else has, mm. um, unless it's somebody really really famous that has it, and they sure. want to make you know like that mm. love. So you fit in there perfectly in that in that category because I mean creating something for a for a, a, a wife that has some kind of something in it that's of her child's uh, you know hair or mm. or I mean I, I can think of so many things yeah, that, you know, yeah, exactly. but and, and to give it to her in, in, a, in a jewelry way in a way that she can wear it in a way that has value uh, in it is just I think that that's a market that you're going to be in my opinion, you're going to be a little bit more overwhelmed. Uh, yeah. You're going to have to really start, you know, um, meeting a lot more of those demands. Because as of now, you're three people. The designer is the designer that designs everything. So if you have, let's say, four or five orders, what happens? You just yeah. put them on waiting list and tell them wait until I finish the first one and the second one? Well, so now we're, I think, around we're eight. So okay. nine, including me. Um, so... The team expanded, so there is um, uh, Frederick, the designer, Jyoti, the uh, sculptor. We have our own gemologist who is based in New York. Um, we have uh, our chairman, so the chairman is uh, is based in, uh, in France. 
He has more than 40 years of knowledge in uh, luxury. He was one of the founders of Cartier in um, in the U.S. Oh wow! Okay. So um, he's he's f- you know wealth of knowledge and guidance. Um, we have our independent watchmaker in in Geneva. Mm. So if you want something very sophisticated, you want a vintage movement, you want something just different, he can make it for you. We have. Um, uh, a, a sales person in uh, Monaco and, and Nice. Uh, so the team team has grown, and um, we also have uh, like other ateliers. Like this, the like Jyoti and our atelier in Nice is one of the they're the best in making very intricate details. Mm. But sometimes you want something that is. Um, like you want five of something for motor rocks, um, you know, uh, very quick, but still artistic. Right. So we have partner ateliers who could do this faster, who could do this, um, you know, with uh, uh, not precious materials. So it's uh, um, scalable. Mm. Um, but I've decided that I don't want to do more than 50 a year. Okay. For the high right. um, masterpieces. Keep it exclusive as well. Yeah. Um, going back to the business, how did you fund this project of yours, this hobby slash project slash yeah. now business? Very you know? expensive how, hobby. How is, I mean, this is not a cheap thing. I mean, just the people that you just named and the people that you're referencing to and where they live and their profession and their experiences. Yeah. So somebody you can put on a payroll, you know, we're, we're not used to that kind of payroll. So how did, how did, how did you source the money to help you with your uh, business endeavor? Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> and this is one of the things that I would like to give, you know, as an advice to people is that before you, you jump in, um, have a clear goal and then, look at what will you need and what you will need is let's say if you want to produce a car your cost does not end with the car being made you need more than double that marketing it right so do your numbers right and don't cut corners Mm. if you want to make a car go for the best available this is something that honestly i've seen so many people um, uh, not only in Bahrain, everywhere, we try to cut corners. And just because I want to get it done, don't just get it done. Just get it done right. Mm. And surround yourself with the right people. Yes, they might be expensive. If you don't want to do it right, either don't do it or change the target market that you're, you're, right, you're, right. Um, you're approaching. So what I did was a hit and miss, honestly. I started in 2018. I was spending, 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 and then I met with uh, with Frederick and Jyoti. I saw that this is a big project, and and they were flexible enough. Now here, this is something that I had to build over over time. You need to have, you need to be shrewd. Um, money with you is worth much more than just giving away. Mm-hmm. So try to uh, ask for payment plans don't uh, don't just buy it like the way i'm doing i'm I'm saying give me 50 percent of your money yeah. and give me the rest the moment you're happy with the product right. do this with your with your suppliers try to divide it over four installments define the timeline and then say i'll pay you x by successful timeline i didn't do this right at the very beginning i was like i was feeling that i need them so let me make them committed by paying them full. Okay, that was okay. a big mistake. Right. Once you pay them the money, then you don't have any leverage. Right. So then COVID hit. As bad as it, as it was, it was fortunate for me. How so? Because the, I was supposed to launch in 2021 or 2020, end of 2020. This forced me to delay the launch, forced me to... Uh, divide the payments and perfect work pay slower so i was able to afford more by having more time okay okay um so to, to the simple answer to your question is that i have funded everything myself um that's uh, 
one of the reasons why like I, I still live in a in a you know rented home <laughs> but I know I'm building something right. tomorrow if I decide to retire I know what I'm gonna do and I'm so passionate about it uh, it's not gonna be like just like not knowing what to do like like many of my family members uh, do there our unfortunately our life becomes less exciting when we retire right it should right. be the other way around I have this image in my head that I'm going to visit you in France in a chateau. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> in south of France somewhere, you know. Hey, Mr. Khanati, like, yes, yes, let him in, let him in. Yeah. <laughs> I know him, let him in. <laughs> it wouldn't be like that, but yes, I will see you there. Now, the interesting thing is what, what you're telling me is that uh, the money that you needed is simply, uh, you had to pay people. It's, it wasn't just money f- for rent or money for for setups or money because a lot, there was no rent there was no setup no. everything is an idea and, a, and an artist and a designer that puts that idea into place um, so you can use these services that we have in Bahrain like Temkin for example how can Temkin help you in something like this maybe in marketing today maybe today if you contact Temkin and tell them that this is my brand and I, and I have a marketing plan now they can play a role in helping you with marketing but other than that, it's you can't go to the bank, you know, Bahrain Investment Bank or, or even your bank for that matter, and tell them loan me money for because it's not something that's for an idea. For an idea, yeah, no, no. So the I had to pay for people's time, uh, so I was paying for a sketch. And the sketch was expensive. <laughs> so imagine what what these things were. Uh, I, I paid for people's time to work, and I paid for materials and gemstones and gold and all of these things. So. The, so these are the three items that I paid for. And then I started to pay for marketing. A photo shoot of that kind in, in France is going to yes, cost. Yes. Uh, my agency is ba- based in, um, in, uh, in, in Milan. Um, you cannot cut corners in luxury. They, they check the quality of the book that you have. They check your card. If you want to do an event, it's all costly. You're setting a, a standard. So. Um, so I did all and I had a very tough goal that I will uh, allocate money till the launch in July and some supporting marketing activities till end of the year 2022 and then I'm going to go out of money (laughs) unless I sell and my chairman was like Mohammed, be realistic. I've seen companies launch and fail or launch and succeed, but it doesn't happen in, in hmm. four months. It happens in three years, right. five years. Don't be upset if you don't sell in three years. That's natural. You don't fruit day one. No, no you don't. So I always said, it is what it is. I just don't have the money. I've, I've paid a lot hmm. and uh, I have to sell. And I sold. I sold my first piece three months down the line in November, and then I sold again, and I sold again, and I sold again. Who was the first customer? Uh, a gentleman in uh, in Dubai. Uh, so I, I don't reveal the names no, of the clients fine, here, fine. but a, a gentleman in Dubai who bought the um, the Roman Empire watch. The uh, one that you didn't want to sell. No, so that was the, the, there's a, for Roman theme, there's a watch and a bracelet. Okay, okay, he bought the watch. He bought the watch, right, right. beautiful watch. Right. So he bought that, and then he designed, um, he requested a bespoke for his wife, and then then we went to uh, U.S., and then we sold a couple of pieces there, and then Dubai again, so. So the then... U.S. Also, was mostly Florida that you went to, or what, whereabouts in the U.S. you usually? Uh, Florida and but we, we, over the last year we covered a lot of places in florida so in, in the us so we went to hamptons vail miami so the, the expensive areas the expensive you have to be that, there that, that yeah. would be interested and yeah. also can afford and also appreciate appreciate that. Um, the uniqueness and the yeah. arts that you're, you're providing two weeks from today in uh, art basel miami okay so see, it's all about connection. So one of the people I met in the Hamptons, I became such a good friend friends with, and um, he owns an art gallery 
that he's inaugurating now on the I think the fourth of December. So uh, um, we will showcase during the the opening in Art Basel. So all of these things like um, create a brand. You know they were from the, yeah I saw it there I saw it here. You do an event, but then you do seven times of that using the video that you did for that uh, right. launch and you promote it so that people can see what this brand, this is a serious brand. Now, have you um, have you tied up with any celebrity people or have you offered your uh, products to anybody in the celebrity field, be it in European celebrity or, or North American yeah. celebrity? Um, or is this something that you're thinking about? Yeah. So uh, thinking about that, see, there are, there are the timeline of the strategy was um, phase one, launch it globally and build a name. Uh, phase two, uh, collaborate. Now, the Ministry of Interior watch. Uh, Something that, you did here. Yeah, so that was a collaboration. How did that, uh, how did that come to be? How were you commissioned on that one? So, um, uh, this awesome gentleman that, you know, I may perhaps prefer not to, you know, mention their names, but they met me last year during Julia Arabia. And they were followers of the brand. Um, they loved the concept and they ordered a few. Um, we took six or seven months to do it and perfect it. And they were so nice to work with. But it was, a, it was like a gifting item mm. at that mm. time. And I didn't show it. I, by the way, I never show any of the bespoke unless the person, the client, accepts to, so you, to show you make it you give it to them and then that's, that's it. it it becomes it's, it's up to them it, it stays a secret it. they were kind enough to share this with the world during Julia Arabia mm. this project was ready like six seven months ago mm. and um, you know it was a mutual agreement to showcase that and honestly I am grateful to them because what what they did is also a support to our fellow Bahraini, of fellow Bahraini. Um, I won't forget People know about me and Bahrain because of them and uh, have the flag, have their coat of arms. I'm just grateful. And uh, the fact that, you know, his, his, uh, his Highness, the Crown Prince, during the inauguration of, of Jewelry Arabia, came and s stopped. He was walking by stuff, looked up and said, I, I, I know this brand. Mm -hmm. That was just just meant the world to me. Yeah. I said, okay, my fa phase one must have done something right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this was um, part of the collaboration part, uh, and I have a few more. He's uh, uh, he notices everything the uh, conference, and uh, he really pays attention to things, and he's very very much supportive of, of local talent and, and local very. stores and local products, and uh, you're definitely one of them. Yeah, so, um, so very I, supportive. I he spent like you know, he spent time asking me, yeah. talking to me, asking about the and he, you know, he's a he's, he's a watch collector. Yeah, yeah. Oh I, wow, I was yeah. Tell you, he's knowledgeable. His, his about questions these were were, were yeah. tough. This, this is not something that he's just talking to you about. No, no, his he, no, he really no. does. He, he is, is a so. watch collector, yeah. and I you know know that about him. He asked very specific questions, and he and I like that he asked these questions because this is. In the watch business is a very tough market. You need to, his questions, if I had not had the answers to them and the answers were not good, it means I need to start, I need to do better mm -hmm. so that I can compete. Competition is not only in Bahrain. I'm taking Bahrain's name outside. So um, his questions were, were absolutely perfect and I'm happy and proud that I, I had the answer for them because you know, again, another advice, never cut corners right. in what you do. So I was proud to answer. I was proud to share this information. So going back, um, were there any things that you would have done differently? Any things that you you thought, you know, I should have done that differently or no, so many any things. regrets? <laughs> oh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's never easy. I wish I managed my funds better. Right. So I wished I planned better. Um, I wished I had not gotten excited. See, you get excited. You get uh, you get excited because there is something in us that we look at. Let's say in um, in France in jewelry, we look up to them because mm -hmm. they are just the best, and you feel you need them. 
and they don't need you. But it's not the case. We need each, we need each other. Mm-hmm. So the, the, you need to have the right mindset. Don't think you are less than anybody else. The moment you think you're less than others, you have a weak contract. You have a weak agreement. So always go with full confidence and know exactly what you want. If you leave it open for, um, like, I need help, I don't know what to do, then you're just weak. Yeah. And, and, and you might be taken for, for granted and you will be sold services that you don't need. Mm. That's number one. Number two, surround yourself with people that um, they care about you and they care about your growth. And through orchestration, again, test them. Test them through, because as long as you have the money and you're paying, everybody is around you. When you don't have the money, some people will go away. Right. So those people you don't want. You want, you want the people who stick around because they believe in, in something greater and they believe in, in, the, in the future. These are the people that you want to keep around. Um, and never sell yourself short. I, when I started... The very few months, I was thinking very low, thinking at a low price point, thinking of cutting quality corners. Um, But then when I knew that my idea is not available globally, um, you know, through the people I've met, mostly Katerina, Mm -hmm. told me work with the best to be noticed. So um, uh, never cut corners, manage your, your, your numbers very well, plan it well, and surround yourself with, uh, with real people and great people. And I failed in all of these, <laughs> and, I, and I worked back my, you know, I worked my way back. Well, you learn through your failures. Oh, you yeah. You don't learn through your success, unfortunately. No, 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 success doesn't. And the person who, listen, compliment is free. Mm-hmm. It's easy. And um, we do it on autopilot. But if someone criticizes you, it means one thing, that he stopped from his busy life, processed what you told him, and criticized your work. Now, okay, you might say he's, he's, in, he's rude, but listen to what he said. He took time to give you feedback. Um, so that, for me, is more valuable than someone who tells you, Oh my God, you're awesome! This is fantastic, and you're, you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm always <clears throat> the person who's critiquing somebody's work, and I'm like, don't hate it. Just, you, people pay money for this. People exactly. pay money for this information exactly. and this kind of feedback. Um, exactly. But um, um, you're right, and this is this is. I mean, these are the things that make certain people stand out from others, and I can see it, and I've always seen it in you, yeah, and you've just never seen yeah. it in the terms of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, but it, it is it is definitely impressive now. You're still working in the bank, correct? Yeah. So when are you going to have that? When, because you love it, and because the because I love marketing. You actually, you built it. You built that brand. Yeah. The bank itself is a brand now that wasn't there when you joined, and you technically created that brand yeah. for your department with you, with you um, involved in it. So that's a little bit difficult also to let go of something that you you know created. But at one point, I believe. <laughs> as a fellow entrepreneur, yeah, uh, you have to kind of like uh, you know severance that uh, relationship and and uh, go full time into the yeah thing that you created. Is this a hundred percent owned by you, or is yeah. it one hundred percent? Hundred percent owned by me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, so I have so there are a few factors. One is that I love what I do in the bank. And everything that is happening, I feel like they are, they're, they're my babies, right? The brand is my baby and all of that stuff. Secondly, I have um, my CEO and myself. From day one, we had a vision of where we want to take this brand. And we're not there yet. The bank brand. The bank brand. Yeah. yeah. The Salam Bank. And we're not there yet. So um, I will not give up or, you know, walk away until... I deliver that because that's part of my personal success. Um, at the same time, I feel if, you know, inshallah, Allah uh, katibli, um, the, the brand keeps on in this success trajectory, I want to still be 
not old enough to, not to be able to um, to take it on so i will not wait until i'm 60 or 65 so i will be you know uh, leaving earlier uh, but it has i have to complete w what i'm doing um, and then time will come for me to leave a bit early to give s f many years to my passion what kind of relationship you have in the bank? I mean, they, they must be very understanding of, of what you're doing, and it's not that easy. I mean, usually in Bahrain, we have uh, it's it's frowned upon to yeah. have people work in a company and then have their own business on the side. It's not True. something that's you know. Although I think the rules are changing. Uh, yeah. I just read something in the article where they're going to allow people to open up their CRs because they see the value in entrepreneurship. That's what I've been trying to tell everybody exactly. that this is really where the where the value is. Um, exactly. But how did it work with you um, and and that relationship and you know if you're having to you have to travel sometimes yeah. and not for the bank yeah. jobs you have to travel for your own person. Yeah. How, how does that work and how can somebody who is listening to you who is in the same situation mm. as you because I can tell you that most of the people I meet they have a job mm. and they always have this passion that they want to do something or they're doing something on the side they just can't give it one hundred percent. Yeah. Most of the people I meet are in that situation. Um, and I understand that not a lot of people are fortunate enough to not, you know, to just have their own funds and, and fund their own interest. Mm. How, what advice, would, how did you do it? And what advice would you give somebody who's listening to you right now and saying, how's he balancing? How's he doing? Yeah. So this is one of the things that I think I did well, you know, uh, everything else was not, <laughs> not too well. Um, be very open and candid about it. From day one, I was very clear with uh, my CEO that I have this passion project and I was also clear that it's this business is going to happen everywhere except Bahrain so it's not and that is by design mm. by design because I want to build an international brand but at the same time because I don't want in Bahrain I'm the chief marketing officer and the head of corporate communication and sustainability for the Salam Bank mm. in Bahrain I'm not going to do for force this now whether it leaks or whether it's just you know it's it is fine but in Bahrain that's what I do so always have alignment set expectations be open about uh, maybe maybe he's, he's just not happy with it and this is before I was even employed this was during the interview so I said this is what I have if it takes time it will take from time for my personal life now how do I manage this is that almost every weekend I'm traveling it takes m time for my family life and that's the sad part of it uh, I convinced myself that I'm building something for the future but then that I will be old enough not to enjoy time with my family it's a choice work-life balance is a myth you choose your, your, your priorities and I've chosen right now this but i have a very good relationship with my my wife and we've set expectations there that i'm going to be working very hard on this now for this coming couple of or three years or four years so every single day most of the time i even come to the office sometimes at 6 30 or sometimes at, at quarter to seven this hour i try to you know finish a few things uh, and then you know 7 45 or 8 I start working I finish because I do intermittent fasting mm -hmm. so I force myself to leave home on time I feel leave office on time so because I'm dead hungry <laughs> I leave at 4 4 15 I go home I eat 5 I start working until midnight and that is when I remove one hat and I put another hat the weekends are completely for my my business um, so that's that's the model that has been working for me and most of what I do is just like you know emails asking like because the work is happening just following up right. arranging for the next uh, event to happen it's not easy now how did you you, you have a vast wealth of marketing knowledge uh, that you've acquired over the years uh, Mahmoud. how have you applied that knowledge into this brand itself I mean uh, how are you utilizing that marketing knowledge and the marketing skills that you have and how are you marketing this product? I actually 
uh, I'm very happy you've asked this question, Samir. Uh, the, I have knowledge being passed on to the bank and vice versa. Hmm. Um, so, like you said, being an entrepreneur, and my CEO sees that value, is rare. So there is a lot of, you become a different person. You, the way you look at the world becomes different. So you become more knowledgeable and more adaptive to things. So I have done things for the benefit of the bank through, like during the last jewelry Arabia, there was, this is just a simple example, no Rolex was ever on display on jewelry Arabia. This one we just yeah. had? No, because they were in Dubai Watch Week. Salam Bank had the only Rolex display, and it was uh, through my connection. I got um, you know a retailer from the U.S. to fly down on their own cost to exhibit Blaken Swiss brand that no one has an agent for in Bahrain, and it was displayed exclusively for for Salam Bank clients. So, wow. yeah. Has that ever been done before? No. Never. Because a bank getting involved in a... a, a say that again. How, how did that happen? So, um, so Salam Bank now is a, a strategic partner with Informa, which is the organizers of Jewelry Arabia and Autumn Fair. Okay. Again, that was something that I saw as a value because I work with the, a lot of exhibitors. So I saw that there is... I mean, this was in the news yesterday. Mm millions of dollars of increased spends happened during Julia Arabia. Right. That goes through a banking partner. Hmm. So, correct, correct. So that bank. banking partner going forward is going to be Salam Bank. So all this money, the POS machine, the, all the banking help to consumers and to businesses and exhibitors will come through Salam Bank. That's very smart. Yeah. And at the same time, you will have, as a Salam client, you will have experiences like you could go and sit in the lounge of um, Julia Arabia and products and masterpieces will be brought to you on a, on a tray to, to be seen and checked. That's very clever. Yeah. So that's some of the things that I am giving back to the bank. But um, the other, you know, f f from, from the bank to, uh, to here or from my purse, see, I... The one thing that I can just, you know, help others who want to be entrepreneurs, have a story. Don't have a product. Don't have a burger that has a better sauce. <laughs> have a story. So I am a, a storyteller. If you have a good story, then become an entrepreneur. If you don't have a story, find a story. And that's what people will remember, the story. I like that. Find yeah. the story. Find the story. What's your story? Yeah, I like that. What the story of your watch? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, that would be yeah. Story of your watch. Whatever story you have, you can incorporate it into your watch now with with Panati. You can freeze time. You can freeze time. You can yeah. freeze time. Um, I have some questions. They're more personal questions. Um, mm. um, you've been to the recent Julia Arabia, right? How was it? It was fantastic. What What, in your opinion, can be done to improve it and make it grow and become a more of a because um, you said Rolex participated in the one in Dubai. And I guess they didn't see value to participate in the one in Bahrain because they participated in the one in Dubai, I'm assuming. What would you, in your opinion, would be something that we can do here in Bahrain, Jewel Arabia can do here in Bahrain that would make somebody like Rolex come to Bahrain as well, not just choose one place a year? Yeah. What would, you know, given the experience that you have and the knowledge in the jewelry business, which is, you know, jewelry, art, watches, you're, actually your knowledge is very vast now, <laughs> marketing. So, see, um, we, can, we, uh, we can either compete with Dubai or collaborate with them. So, um, if you can't beat them, join them. Hmm. And if they can't beat, they cannot beat us in Jewelry Arabia, it's the biggest one in the world. Hmm. So, um, now, for whatever reason, these two events happened at the same time. Could have, uh, could it have been avoided? Maybe, maybe not. But they could have worked together. Um, now, Dubai is not going to stop rocking, and we should not stop rocking. Um, there's a way that we could do both. And the progress, the next level for Jewelry Arabia is that the big brands, the boutiques themselves exhibit here. Hmm. You need them. 
You need Patek Philippe, the mother company. You need those big brands. Because this is going to bring a different... Then it, it moves a little bit from being a B2C into a thought leadership event where brands launch their new products. Uh, this happens once a year and... Um, Watches and Wonders in, uh, in uh, Geneva. This could be, the, the, it's six months away. So it could have it here as well. So you can have, a, this is the, the, the second uh, product uh, reveal spot. Uh, the second issue that I find with Julia Arabia that could be improved is the, perhaps the, the, the logistics. So many people complain about the, the traffic getting into. And some people just give up and, and, and go back. This is the uh, customers, the visitors. Visitors, no, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, we, we as exhibitors used to go like hours mm -hmm. early, which was fine. But the to reach, this just becomes the traffic. Uh, but I mean, the thing is, is, is we, are, we have great experience with Formula One. I think if the same thing gets adapted, it could work. Yep. Actually, I had a friend of mine just yesterday say that, say something similar to what you're saying. Uh, that we have the experience, we have the knowledge. Yeah, we yeah. should just apply it to the other things that we're doing in yeah, Bahrain, yeah. and not just one. one it can thing. be done. I mean, yeah. it's, uh... how are you? Now you, you spoke. I heard you say something that when you actually uh, give the the, the bracelet slash watch to the client, you give them an NFT, you give them a video of the whole process. So you practically answered the question I have. But how are you integrating the digital world that we're going in so fast? into this thing uh nfts is one of them what you're doing uh documenting the journey of that particular timepiece or bracelets to the customer also is another piece but primarily you are as of today uh, a website that people go to and people can contact website you website and, and instagram are the biggest two right so one uh, again that's a very good question the um, i've explored digital a lot. The, given the, um, the, the nature of the business and the price tag attached to it, digital can create, can warm up leads. So someone is, gets interested and then wants to speak to someone because then it becomes a very back and forth conversation. Now, in our business, um, one of the most um, cri critical time is the sketching phase. Mm. So let's say I know you mentioned that you want to make a piece, something about an anniversary or, or something like that. We could spend, let's say, two weeks studying you, um, sketching, and then you could say, I don't want it. Now that's cost, time and money. Where digital, that's something that I'm building right now, where I can to, to scale up the business is using artificial intelligence to first study the person through its social, the person's social media, define what are the su subjects that are close to this person's heart, and propose some sketches. Hmm. So this, from a reactive way, I can be proactive. I can actually come to you if you tell me, Mohammed, I want you to meet my friend. Are you free in two hours' time? I can have a sketch ready for you, for, for your friend in two hours' time. And artificial intelligence learns the style of the designer, learns the design identity of the brand. I mean, it will, won't replace, it will never replace the designer, but it will attract your attention mm -hmm. to look at me and say, oh, wow, that's nice, that's, that's me. Okay, let me now start. So that's how... And then the next step would be how can artificial intelligence and the tools that are existing right now, like DALI 3 and all of these things, to take that sketch and show it to you immediately in a 3D model. Uh, so that is going to be a huge help for, for us. Let's say a year from now, all of this is going to happen on an, uh, a tablet. Mm -hmm. So I can sit with you, a configurator. Well, the configurator is more of a tell your story, I'm going to write it down in chat GPT, and, and then it shows you sketches, you choose the one you want, and then it gives you another four options, you choose the one, you see it in 3D. Are you thinking in the future of incorporating some kind of a digitalization into your products? Um, 
I know, I don't think Rolexes have done. I think they're still, you know, but a lot of companies have. I've seen some of the companies that I like as well. Um, And, you know, with the Apple Watch and mm-hmm. everybody now has an Apple Watch. Is, it's not really a watch anymore. It's basically your phone and your wrist. Yeah. But um, um, it complements what you're doing because, as you said, you're jewelry. So you can wear one on one wrist and one. I've seen people wear an Apple Watch on one yeah. and a Rolex on the uh, other. And they're yeah, like, yeah. wait a minute, these are two watches. It's normal. Yeah. yeah that's, that's... Uh, well, you know, so it, it's happening. This is this is going on um, and, and because it's, the digital is not really just a watch. But... Mm. Are you leaving that alone completely and let the people who are involved in that area of digitalization do what they do best and you do what you do best? Or is it something maybe you're thinking in the future, I might have some kind of a digital concept or if I strike a relationship with some organization out there that, that specializes in digital watches or is it something you're entertaining right now? Or is yeah, it's there, but until I get, until I get to that point or... The sky is the limit. Right. And um, if... If it complement, if that digital item or gadget or whatever digital item is going to help co- uh, tell your story, then, yeah. it, then it becomes mandatory. Um, whether we're going to do a collection based on that, again, the sky is the limit. I mean, it's not only jewelry. It can be anything that, that can bring the idea to life. Uh, so the answer is yes. Mm. That's not impossible. Are you sticking with bracelets or are you going to be expanding more into, say, opticals and things like that? Or is it Kanati uh, sticking to bracelets and watches at this time? It would. Uh, it's something that I envision doing, yeah. like um, line extensions. Right. Uh, again, things that are personal. Right. I feel the specs are personal. Yeah. You know, cufflings are personal. Uh, perfume is personal. Things that are sentimental. Mm. Yeah. Not for the sake of things. Um, how would you define success? By failing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> If you're able to avoid the mistake the next time. Right. Not repeat it. Success is not... Uh, actually, uh, we had this discussion in the bank the other day and people were saying success is becoming... Uh, getting promoted. I have a different point of view. Success is trying to just learn from what you do And have very short-term goalposts mm. so that you can avoid them, you avoid them. Mm. And to be able to do that is you need to be very self-aware. Review what you do and assess them. So you're, and on that note, you're, also, you're constantly educating yourself in the area of business that you're in. Oh, I'm uh, very critical of myself yeah. and I'm not so happy. <laughs> <laughs> you never will be. <laughs> never will be. Because it never stops. It never stops. Learning and never it, stops. And it's tiring. Yeah. But the moment you do something good, so celebrate the the short achievements. Mm. So success is, 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 is all of these things. Three pieces of advice you would give to people who want to succeed in business or are thinking of becoming an entrepreneur. I need more than three, but I'll, I'll sh- summarize to three. Uh, One, can... Uh, do your numbers well, so finances well, and to do that you need to have a very clear goal. Your goal is not I want to have a restaurant. The goal is something much beyond that. I want to have the the best dining experience in the field of um, nature. I don't know something crazy that did not exist before. So once you have that, do your numbers well. Number two, surround yourself with the right people. People who care about you, who believe in your idea and not just compliment what you do. Um, number three, always have um, a story. And um, uh, I, what makes it natural or what makes it successful if it's a natural story. Don't force it. I mean, with me, I just made connected dots and then the story became so natural and look outside of Bahrain the the world doesn't stop here Um, yeah I think that was four (laughs) Um, you've mentioned about your old boss uh, that that he's you know I think he's a role model too but um, who's the person that you most admire and doesn't have to be somebody that you know it could be somebody that you don't know but somebody that you look up to and think hmm This is actually what I want to be like, who I want to be like. Is there any particular person that you admire internationally or even? 
not one person um, not one person uh, as a complete I like th different things uh, things from different people so um, this, I like the op openness and uh, courage of Elon Musk mm. I like the attitude of my uncle mm. I like the mindset of my old boss mm. um, I like the wisdom of my wife mm. um, so different things because you will not find I was I the story of Prophet Abraham is very close to my heart I uh, I don't know why but whenever I hear his story that's the ultimate sacrifice mm. so I I relate to that story a lot as well mm. Um, favorite books that you've read that you that helped you? That I made... never read. <laughs> I watch lots of YouTube videos, right. audio books. Right. I think uh, two two that I could I al always remember: uh, Blue Ocean, Red Ocean. Yes. And the Art of War. Okay. Okay. The typical ones. Yep. yep, yep, yep. <laughs> what does the future look like to you? Uh, spending time in the atelier, uh, enjoying the smaller things, meeting clients, and uh, making their stories come true, and then see my kids uh, continuing the business. Wow, that's yeah. nice. Yeah, that nice. that's more of a like a wish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you're, you're what you're building and what you're doing and how it's branded. Um, and you're at this current stage of your life doing it. I think it's uh, your, your kids are seeing you and they're looking to they're seeing what you're achieving. They're actually growing yeah. with you, with your brand. They're growing with the Qanati That's brand true. itself as well. Yeah. So they're part of it. And I think it'll be easier for them to understand and accept and lead it to the next stage yeah given the fact that they're seeing you um, i mean it's not something you inherited from your father yeah. they, you know it's something that they yeah they're living through that experience yeah um, because they also saw that this this is the brand that took me away from them sometimes yeah so it's hard for me to um stop that resentment right. towards the brand right uh, which happens sometimes which is natural yeah but I'm trying to involve them. Like my oh, very simple idea, my son, when he was much younger, he said, one day I want to have a watch or a bracelet with a megalodon tooth. <laughs> I bought the megalodon tooth. No way. Yeah, and I'm keeping it to say that one day this is going to go into your bracelet. No way. <laughs> that, is, that is cool. How old is he? He's now 11. Oh, that's so cool. That's he's, so not cool. A, he's not a kid anymore. <laughs> Mine is 12, so I can Mashallah, relate. Mashallah, Mashallah. Finally, cars. Uh, you know, cars. I, this is not about cars. I have a different, you know, <laughs> program about cars. This is uh, this is big talk, but uh, we do love cars, and we met in cars. And yes. uh, is this something you're still passionate about? Is something involved, or you're gonna put it on the side until you create that wealth that I know you're gonna be creating in the future, and then you're gonna start choosing those cars and putting them in your chateau in France. Uh, I love cars. Perhaps maybe that's why I don't. Or it's difficult for me to... F I don't have a favorite car. It's very difficult for me to, to, to choose a favorite car. I love lots of cars. I, uh, a, a, peace, a peaceful time away from what I do is watching my favorite um, uh, automotive channel called Donut Media. Yes. And yes. I've been a fan of this channel for, I think, more than eight, yes, eight years. I love that channel. I love it. I just watch it from the day all you need to know about. Yeah, so yeah. I love it. I check uh, what new models are coming out. Um, I know that I will have time to enjoy that, but not yet. Yeah. At least what I did now in the collection, like the Formula One collection, is based on Monaco. And um, given the, the glamorous race, it took a piece of carbon fiber from a car that crashed in, uh, F1 car that crashed in Monaco and, and embedded it into the, no way. Into the piece. Yeah, so I'm staying close to 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 automotive, but not close enough that I would love to. But it's, but racing uh, cars are close to my heart. 
the the car area i mean the, the automobile industry would would you know there's a relationship between bracelets watches and, and the automobile industry we've seen f1 drivers uh, you know have drive you know wear a watch and all these stuff so i think you have something there that you can actually oh, uh penetrate and absolutely. really partake in and and, mm. and take it and i'll come to you for advice yes yes please <laughs> maybe that's when we start investing you know, yes. really. um thank you so much mahmoud for thank being on our show so big talk um really really appreciated your time here we're going to have you back again because we want to see uh, exactly what you're doing and everything that you're doing we're extremely proud of what you've achieved thank you uh, as a person in this industry and as a bahraini and uh, again just thank you thank you very much thank you samir so much for allowing this platform to to share my story and share the the journey with with everybody else who i would truly recommend go through it it's tough but it's it's really really fruitful thank you so much thank you, thank you.